Ok, klikam rekord. Ta, recording, dobro. Hello guys, you speak in English because uh, here is Tiana from Side the Heads. I will introduce her later. And also we have another guest that don't speak Serbian. So the whole evening will be in uh, English. I wish you a warm welcome in front of the CGA, Belgrade. Uh, this is the first Houdini user group event and we really hope that we uh, host many more. Uh, CGA is, uh, I think that many of you know, but it's a really like community effort to bring together artists and uh, students and uh, seniors and the uh, owners of companies. So all levels of, uh, let's say, uh, seniority uh, from our industry, so gaming, visual effects, uh, all different, uh, you know, like uh, uh, fields of uh, digital design, uh, digital art, and so on, to bring everyone together to share our knowledge, uh, to you know, like learn and to be better every day and to do big things here in Serbia. So uh, start, start over. <laughs> so now, okay. No, I will not start over. Uh, so we are in Creator Training Center. We are doing education, uh, a lot of education work uh, for bringing the young people uh, and uh, give them some entrance into our industry. And uh, from the part of Serbian Film Commission that are our partner uh, in CGA, here is Milica. As a completely complete stranger to Houdini world, just an admirer, I have to just stress the, the, the fact that first ever CGA branded event was a TV course and we had Andrew Lowell who actually talked about Houdini. So it's in a way full circle for us after six years to start with a, with a Houdini event and uh, having now Fiana here. Uh, for those who haven't registered for tomorrow, I only can say don't miss tomorrow's session live in MTS Dvorana and enjoy the hangout and getting together tonight. So that's all. So I didn't make any speech. Um, I don't actually know what I'm going to say aside from thank you uh, for hosting this place, uh, this event at Crater. Um, I hope that there will be many more uh, user groups going on, and Nikola <laughs> <laughs> and Bogdan will be kind of like gatekeepers of that, so uh, I will leave it to you guys to, uh, I don't know, run the show. So I just want to say, Julie! 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 I am the gatekeeper, are you the key master? Ah, good bad reference, no? Okay, I think I can start this, right? Cool. So, uh, Nicola, sorry, yes. I just forgot to mention the Dota isn't coming. Can yes. You tell the guys the Dota um, <laughs> I have some news. <laughs> <sighs> Dota isn't coming. <laughs> but uh, that only means that I can like probably do my presentation a little bit longer, I guess. And that maybe we can have a little bit more time if any questions might arise in the end. Uh, actually, on topic of that, since this is a hangout group, uh, I generally like to do these things completely casually. So feel free to interrupt with questions anytime or save them for, for the end. Whatever is easier for you, I will completely uh, uh, accommodate. So I guess we can talk. I may, I might use a couple of swear words. Uh, I hope that will not be beeped out, will it? No. No? Okay, yes. Serbian. What? Sorry? Okay, I might. I might then. <laughs> cool. So, uh, I think that maybe we can, we can uh, like, get this thing uh, uh, on the road. It's, it's a very special event for me because it kind of, uh, like, groups a lot of things which are very dear to my heart. Uh, like, you know, like both Crater and, uh, and, and Houdini and, and CGA. Uh, all the things which I have like come into very close contact in the last few years. So this is like a very cool moment for me, like being able to kind of be the first actual speaker on the first actual Houdini user group uh, uh, in Belgrade. Uh, so I don't know like, how many of you like know me or, or have seen uh, like my previous talks or know what I actually like do for a living and not for a living. 
uh, for fun as well. Uh, but just to kind of let me a little bit kind of guide you through to the stuff that I've done. Uh, but today talk will not be about my usual uh, stuff that I that I do. So my I, I like to like I like to like tell this joke all the time that I have like this kind of day job and night job and I always use this Batman reference because I'm trying to kind of be cool as Batman even though I'm not. Uh, so my day job basically I'm working in Nordius and I have been there for like 10 years. It has been 10 years in January uh, this year. And over the years I started as a 3D generalist and now I'm actually leading a small R&D team which is basically responsible of to kind of completely like turn upside down any means of our kind of in-house production where Houdini plays a really, really big role. Uh, I'm not the only guy do, do, doing Houdini in company, but uh, I do it more than the other guy. So, <laughs> uh, but that, that's kind of, I mean, that is actually the testament of how much stuff like, a single person can do, like when you have a, a proper tool uh, under, your, under your fingertips, you know? So my, my usual kind of stuff that I use Houdini in like, it's kind of making like a lot of VFX that this was like for Heroic, for some demos in, in, uh, on Unite. Uh, I sometimes do a little bit of kind of inspirational or prototyping mockups of building uh, procedural environments for the game where like designers can go in and test out like, hey, how about if this is a forest? Is it autumn? Do we have two lanes, three lanes? Just scatter some rocks. It doesn't matter. This is like prototyping. Houdini is super useful for uh, for that. Even on a mobile gaming uh, scale, I might uh, I might add. Uh, sometimes I do things for offline rendering, like building environments, height fields that go into just being backgrounds for for the uh, for the for the game. And so, on like other parts of the job is like of course Nordius football. This is like the absolutely biggest game we we have uh, ever made and and still is. It's crazy kind of big and it's still like very much evergreen after like 11 years of, of existence. So uh, like most of the time I cannot show you actually the, the cool, cool stuff I do on top 11 because uh, maybe in like a year or two, hopefully I can repeat that. But you can imagine, you know, it's football, it's football players, it's fans. I do a lot of these kind of fan packing, making them animate and whatnot. And since we do have a lot of mocap that we do in-house, Every once in a while, I take, I take a lunch break and I kind of grab a cool mocap file and I do some kind of like, let's, let's see how can I like deconstruct this motion. Maybe I can do some style frames to inspire maybe marketing or somebody else for a new campaign. And I do like a lot of these things. I'm just kind of going to show you like a couple. Just trying to kind of, let's see what tools can I just kind of trash onto this mocap. KineFX is awesome for these kind of things, just by the way. And that's it. And sometimes some cool wallpapers turn out. Uh, this one was very popular inside of the company. Uh, so yes. So the things that you see here, it's just my experiments. The uh, the environments that you have seen before that, uh, the one with like separate biomes, like uh, for, you know, like desert, forest, that was pre-rendered. But the one that you see before before that, we with me like placing trees and rocks and defining lanes, that was actually pushed directly to the engine and optimized to run on, on the mobile device. That was heroic. That was heroic, yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is just for, for show and inspiring uh, people. And even on a company level, like I use it a lot when we were doing this kind of whole rebrand thing inside of the company, I abused all of the Entagma uh, tutorials for that. Uh, absolutely, thank you, <laughs> Moritz and the crew. Uh, uh, I kind of picked up all the all the famous out of the company. Actually, I just kind of was, was standing on the shoulder of, of really really big giants. Uh, but you know, like progressing from that, like every once in a while we had these internal events. Uh, like like this was like for the tenth uh, birthday of Nordius, where did we did a whole bunch of kind of like in-house motion graphics, promoting a lot of stuff uh, because we like to celebrate these things internally uh, a lot, and I like to then celebrate them by doing a lot of cool. Uh, graphics to, to, to support. Uh, but then, you see, Batman? Uh, on my night job, I do completely different things, you know, because my challenges in the company are, are pretty cool, but they are a little bit, I won't call them single track, but really it's like more focused on, on like technical stuff, more focused on like, especially now on football, and especially, you know, more kind of geared towards the uh, like the data that our users kind of want and need, that the product designer needs and stuff like that. So I like to uh, like unwind and experiment a lot uh, out, outside of those, let's say, uh, like product uh, uh, like boundaries, you know. Uh, so I like to like use Houdini to do, you know, like procedural characters. 
This is actually one of the first thing I did in Houdini. Like, do not do this as the first thing in Houdini. Uh, like so many uh, painful things. Uh, like this took, I don't know, like, I would say maybe three months of, of various experiments. Uh, but nevertheless, I achieved some kind of a goal. Uh, what was easier was like doing some procedural environments and, uh, uh, and, and rendering. Uh, this kind of got me actually hooked into Houdini. Uh, then my first, sorry, somebody said something? No. If you have questions, just, just go. Uh, I have no problem. No, actually, back then I didn't know how to properly render in Houdini. So this was exported and rendered uh, in, in Max in, uh, in, in V-Ray. Right now, I would actually render it in, in, in Houdini. I have an open Max in quite a while now. And the lights and uh, what's not the port, where did you do that? Uh, everything that you see here, the render here, everything is lit by one big area light and one, one HDR. That's all the light. There's a lot of refractive elements here, so like, there's a lot of like loud light. Or or Very little color correction, uh, because but the shader complexity here was actually pretty like a lot. There's a lot like there's like subsurface, there's refraction, there's dispersion. Yeah, the blue to purple variant is really obvious, so I don't know if that's in the, that's in the shader. That's in the, that's in the shader, yes. It's just a kind of like a fall off, you know, like like dispersion and 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 kind of a, I think it was like a distance based refraction, maybe on some fall off curve. Uh, I also use Houdini. I do a lot of materials, by the way. Uh, I use Substance a lot, and I kind of try to find a way how can I use Houdini to make some cool materials. Maybe there are some new approaches there. I've used Vellum a lot for making materials now. Like this is pretty cool. Just kind of build a procedural tentacle, scatter it around, simulate, make it tile. Boom, you have a material. Also, some rigid, uh, rigid like uh, simulations as well, which you can really quickly come out with really nice looking materials. Like actually building this, maybe like in designer, might give you a bit more flexibility, but you cannot do it as fast as like actually simulating and, and doing it uh, that way. I do like I worked on on the dawning. Thank you, Fiona. That that was just a pretty cool experience for for me. And eventually, I did a tutorial for for like train, which you can find it's like a pretty detailed high fields tutorial for Houdi for Houdini that you can find on the side effects uh, website. I kind of show all the steps uh, in making these different three, three different uh, biomes. And of course, Houdini user generators generate everything. Like I do a lot of these generators and like if you ever want to impress a non-tech art person, just show them a generator for anything, you know. <laughs> People are so easily impressed by these things and they're not that difficult to do, especially in Houdini. I do like broom generators, I do like pumpkin generators. This was uh, awesome because uh, I made a generator for pumpkins, but you can actually like uh, draw on a piece of paper you, what you wanted as a, as a cutout and you take a photo and like you use uh, auto trace and uh, automatically kind of booleans and creates uh, actually, you can just kind of click on a button, export it as an as a AR filter for, for Snapchat. Uh, that was kind of fun to, to play around with as well. Uh, like a potion generator. Uh, for like this scene that I'm currently building. I know I generate a lot of stuff, of course. I mean, it's, it's Houdini, you need to build generators. But I, I'm, I have decided that, not decided, I have realized that I need to like expand my, my Batman uh, Bruce Wayne joke because I've realized that in the past, last maybe year and a half, a third person is kind of slowly kind of crawling outside of me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because like, like you get this, like day job guy, like doing this very serious stuff, you know, talking with designers, marketing people, get this nighttime guy, God knows when, when he's going to you know, go to sleep with all these cool gadgets just kind of playing around. But I kind of figured out that I'm kind of doing all this technical stuff, doing a lot of technical challenges, but slowly like this kind of creative person is me, is like maybe wanting for something a bit more, I'd uh, say kind of meaningful or artistic. So I wanted to kind of this person wants to be an artist, let's call it like, uh, like that. And like, you know, like every artist, and especially like this artist, uh, like my, like that person inside of me is very chaotic. I think I have around 50 folders of projects I never finished. Uh, and they're like, they're slowly piling up over the years. This is just a kind of small selection of stuff that I was so hyped when I started working on and never actually uh, actually finished. You see another generator, here you go. This is like a neon sign generator based on the imported yeah, AI file. Yes, I did, I did. Uh, but I never finished it. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I keep telling myself if I post it, I will self persuade myself that I have to finish it, but it never works. It, it never, never works. 
uh, but every once in a while I like do finish something uh, and I realized that usually the things that I tend to finish in the last period was things that were more way more abstract maybe it was my maybe like a, I don't know soul searching moment trying to actually find the artist in me and uh, so these are kind of these works and I said like cool maybe I can try like this being an artist thing like what I need to do to try actually being an artist not like, not like a tech artist not a tech guy uh, because like everybody in the company, like they all come to me for technical like questions. Almost nobody comes to me for stylistic questions, and I do have knowledge there like, as well. I promise. Uh, so I went this on this journey as well, and uh, luck be it, I got invited to this. Uh, I don't know why I got invited to be honest, but I did got invited. Uh, like this is uh, like uh, this country's uh, Biennale, which was this year organized in 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 Panchevo. Uh, it was awesome event, like, uh, I haven't been to Pancho in a very long while, I don't know why, Pancho is actually pretty cool to, to kind of go out on a day trip and, and just kind of chill out uh, there. But I had this huge privilege of actually being invited to kind of participate in our country Biennale. That was kind of mind-blowing to me. And I was like, but, okay, well, what can I do? I don't want to do something digital, I really want to, like, if I'm going to go among the artists, I want to become with something physical, and I don't want to do just something digital. And the whole team around the, the like this year's Biennale was called uh, like Monastery Refinery. Uh, it's a pretty trippy thing in Pancho because I think like there's a hundred and fifty meter distance between like this huge industrial refinery and uh, like a monastery. So like the like the contrast you just get by by being there is pretty interesting. So this kind of taught me okay okay I'm I'm too young in this artistic journey to start maybe doing maybe especially religious commentary and, and political commentary as well. So I'm staying far away clear from that. But maybe there's something about this kind of oil refinery thing that might be interesting. So uh, luck be it, I was researching like these kind of like micro fossils, uh, like radiolaria and stuff like that, which are pretty awesome source of inspiration whenever you're doing something procedural, because like they look like they've been generated. Uh, and it's like, cool, maybe I can do uh, something like this. And this is my idea. I designed like this procedural looking uh, flower. This project started actually from a course and then kind of expanded later into a bit bigger, a bit bigger personal uh, uh, project. And the actual kind of building was okay in Kudin. I mean, I did kind of try to follow the, the references. I tried to kind of see how flowers are built, try to replicate that. Like, this is the stem, this is the head, this is how this grows. I wanted to kind of build these outer layers of kind of more like bigger complexity, but but like thinner and, and more finite uh, structure, kind of give it uh, uh, lightness. Like this is basically kind of my vision of a of a flower growing uh, from like microfossil, which has died in uh, in in some kind of oil. And I had this quite, but I didn't want to just present it uh, as itself. I wanted to build some kind of environment. And my initial idea was to print this entire thing as a, as a sculpture. Uh, sadly, my, my, my enthusiast, enthusiastic bubble was bursted very fast uh, because printing this, uh, especially for somebody who hasn't printed anything in their life, uh, 3D printed, I have used the printer, obviously, uh, proved out to be actually like quite, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, why a challenge? Some things are super easy, Kudini. You, you need a watertight mesh, VDB is your friend, that's, that's quite easy. Uh, but other things are not, like... When, you, when I was kind of, kind of thinking this as an artist, I was thinking more about, you know, how things look, but not how things would actually function. So, you know, like, too thin, over there, uh, too thin elements, things would, would break during printing. This is one of the failed prints. Uh, we had, like, three failed prints. And it's like, you print it for three days, no, then, then you realize it's failed. Okay. <laughs> you see? <laughs> I forgot to mute some of the videos. Then, uh, so uh, it was a little bit of a trial and, and, and error, uh, in a sense that we literally had three failed prints. And uh, what, what we, you can see actually the changes that we went from the initial design to the final. They were not that big, but I was bothered. They didn't want like this to be that thick. But in the end, we had to kind of thicken up some things. I had to kind of balance the flower morts towards the, uh, like towards the, the front to counter for that and stuff like that. I actually even did, I thought it would be cool, I did like a small proxy model of this entire flower and I tried to kind of do like a rigid body simulation just to drop it from a small height to see if it will kind of, if I, if when I print it, will it stand on its own, on its own. 
I have no idea if that has any physical merit, but it worked in simulation and it worked when it got printed. So I'm gonna say that it works like this. That's like a cool tip for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So in the end, uh, what we did is we ended up kind of splitting it, not because we had to, the actual printer could print it uh, like from single, but we, we just decided to kind of de-risk the entire situation. So if some of the prints get fucked up, we just need to kind of, I don't know, redo this part, not the entire, not the entire thing. Uh, going back to this uh, before the audio starts. In, uh, so look at this, this is pretty cool. This is the thing I learned. So uh, this, this, print version was actually printed in, the, in some printing version, which, uh, so there's no resin. The entire thing is like a powder and there's like a focused layer that melts that powder and creates the, uh, the actual 3D sculpture. So this requires no, no supports whatsoever. You just kind of take out the sculpture out from, from, from the powder material. That failed. This succeeded though. But this was a, a bit of uh, other approach. All these supports, and there was a lot of them, when this was kind of finished printing, it, it was almost like a solid cube of, of, of plastic when this finished. But these supports are completely water dissolvable. So you print it, and then you keep it in the water for like a day, and all these supports, they just dissolve. That's completely new to me, and pretty, pretty, pretty cool. So this was the final result. You can see it like in, in scale. It's, it's not small, it's nice, it's like it really looks, I wish I could have brought it with me, <laughs> but I, I couldn't sadly. Uh, one of the failed prints, and in the end, I couldn't print the entire thing, but I did kind of print this on, on a, like acrylic, the, I placed this on the wall just to create a little bit uh, uh, of, uh, of, of depth. Uh, I was happy, I was not entirely happy, I didn't like achieve my goal, uh, but then like NVIDIA did a cover piece on it. What was like, cool, nice, that's, that's cool. Local TV news covered it. Okay, nice. We are going something. And I got myself printed in a book where artists get their name printed in a book. So, victory. And now, like, my ego was, like, completely, you know, like, very, very, very high levels of ego. Uh, maybe, maybe too high for my own good. But I was like, you know, I have this, like, new toy, which I bought, uh, which is actually, like, a 2D plotting uh, machine, which I haven't played that much uh, since I bought it. But I was like, I have this. Now, I, with my new artistic uh, uh, talents that I have discovered, I want to do only my own uh, exhibition. I don't want to be, like, part of this small exhibition biennale, god damn it. I want to do my own thing. So what did I decided to, to do? I had this, I had this, like while I was learning Houdini, I did a couple of these kind of abstract like line drawing experiments just to actually test the actual machine, not to actually do any, any, any proper art. But I decided that maybe it's time to kind of take this a step uh, a little bit further. And obviously, uh, whenever I do, I don't start small. I decided to open my own gallery slash museum. <laughs> of course, that's, that's, that's what you do, yeah. So, uh, long story short, I have a friend who is like a theater director and he has this kind of museum of, of all men, uh, where the concept is like a huge apartment, every room has their own, like one room is dedicated to the museum of like uh, academic painters, one room is a museum of uh, Dorchel's theater, you know, like every room is like a different gallery space slash museum and everything kind of should like collaborate and coexist in this big apartment. And I was talking to him and I was like, you know, to my knowledge, Berkeley doesn't have like a museum or gallery for abstract art. I'm gonna open that. And again, since I'm in the presence of other artists, I don't wanna go there digital, at least in phase one, I wanna go there analog. So I'm going to print, uh, uh, of course, anything. But I'm not gonna print, I'm gonna like gonna teach that robot hand how to draw it instead of me, because that's, that's cool. So this was kind of the, the, the space when I got there. So I kind of loaded up on all the different pens and papers because it's a learning curve, like tr trying to use that thing because there's so many options you, you can use like this pen, this paper, this weight of paper, this texture, like how many ink does it absorb? Does the, like, and then you need to tweak the, like, the speed of the arm moving across the paper because if you move it slowly, it will leave more ink. If you move it too fast, it will leave less ink. If you move it too fast, the line will break and stuff like that, you know? And very quickly, I had this whole bunch of kind of sheet of various, various uh, uh, experiments, which, which I was kind of trying to kind of figure out. 
and the whole concept of the of the exhibition, so call it the the the, the name was uh, like knot, chvor or loop in a sense. I was trying to kind of uh, like realize, or at least kind of draw a parallel between like a line, which is let's say like a like a, the like the most basic element of any drawing, and like a line of code or a loop, which is kind of the most basic element of any kind of software. So that's kind of the the area which I was uh, trying to experiment, like how well, like which code, which tools can I use to kind of turn these lines into knots or try to kind of at least design them into something which is either chaotic or very specifically are directed in a, uh, in a sense. And some things were very kind of based on just simple kind of SOP level things that you can do in, in, in Houdini, you know, just like progressive or noise with, with like concentric circles uh, and stuff like uh, that. Some were like based on like actually like advecting, you know, particles through, uh, through like f uh, noise flow fields uh, to kind of trying to kind of fill in a, a certain uh, uh, shape. And again, I abused Vellum a lot. So these are basically Vellum simulations turned into, into line art. And I could, I could play with this like endlessly, you know, it's just like immediate, immediate fun. Uh, even this, you know, like sometimes I'll just kind of simulate some lines trying to find the specific shape that I like and then take it from there and extract them before I, before I print it. Uh, even this, you know, like just take a figure which, which, may, which means something to me and trying to kind of just, just using kind of vellum and noise to kind of fit it into a specific, uh, specific shape. This is actually like vellum. With, con with like animated constraints pulling and, and, uh, and pulling like specific points uh, uh, together then relaxing to get uh, specific shapes as well. And this is like hair uh, on vellum and simulation simulation. Things can get really complex quite, uh, quite easily. Sometimes I'd like specifically design uh, shapes that I like. I draw them like freehand first, then I simulate them. So I, I'm not like completely procedural in this uh, approach. Sometimes it's like I, when I want to like really specific flowy uh, flowy lines, and sometimes I actually just kind of let the simulation grow uh, on its uh, own. Uh, basically, what you see here is like like infection-based, uh, um, uh, let's say, short shortest path growth through a structure which is basically uh, like a lot su uh, subdivided. And then you, you know, I try to build this. Let's call them, you know, like digital virtual uh, uh, spaces. I mean, it does look a little bit like a floor plans of uh, of uh, of, uh, I don't know, buildings, apartments, uh, whatnot. This was a very nice experiment for me. I quite enjoyed it. And like sometimes I try to kind of grow things uh, in and I really liked how this looks, this kind of like, like once it clash, you should, you should stop type of growth. And having this kind of let's go into physical mind, I actually made a lamp out of that one. Uh, and this is so cool to see <laughs> live. I had the like, help with uh, uh, like this, a workshop called Proto. They're somewhere, I think, in, in Zemun Pod or somewhere. They're kind of specialized in helping artists produce stuff for their exhibitions. And they're like super, super helpful with, with designing this. They, they did this in like less than a day, I think. Uh, it was quite easy because they just told me, okay, but like, you know, like we cannot have a sharp angle here. This needs to be at least radius of two centimeters so we can like bend the LED uh, around it. And like, can you send us a vector so we can just kind of CNC the entire thing, I said like, yeah, two centimeters uh, vector, it's like two clicks in Houdini, I send them everything. It's a strap of LEDs, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it looks almost as neon. <laughs> uh, actually doing this in neon would probably look even cooler, but I, I don't think that you can do it in a day, to be honest. Probably like actually bending all the glass and sometimes I, things get really, really messy. Uh, I printed this in like, I think this was printed maybe to be like, I don't know, like two meters wide print in a, in a, in a wall. Uh, it looks way more impressive in print to be, to be honest. And this would just like, let like a set up rules of things to kind of grow and expand specific points who were supposed to like attract each other, specific points were supposed to not attract each other. Then I did some trails and connections and they just kind of let it unfold and it just kind of grows like a, like a, like a, like a, I don't know, like an organism and whatnot. Super fun to watch. Uh, but sometimes I'm also like very specific, like, and constructed, like very art directed, that I want like very specific shapes in a very specific uh, position. And Houdini can do all of that, like, like, because 
when you break it down, in the end, it's just like rule sets that you that you set up and, and you let it you let it unfold. The big like the hardest thing was like choosing the which variation you like the most, <laughs> because like when you start generating these things, you start generating like, like easily like tens, hundreds, like million, how how much you want. So in the end, I actually just kind of selected it and random because it was easier. You know, when they ask you like what is your, what is your favorite kid? Yeah, I don't I cannot tell you that. <laughs> Pick one yourself. Uh, I was also kind of try to kind of make this like a like a digital uh, uh, iris uh, uh, as well. And this was a fun experiment as well. This was kind of, I took a face and I, I tried to like uh, calculate like the slope gradient along the, the face. And then I, I kind of let the, like the particles flow up and down to, to the face. And then I generated lines from, 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 their, from their trails. And like a whole bunch of uh, other experiments, you know? Like, again, I abused a lot of entanglement tutorials as, as well. Maybe you can even recognize some. But it's pretty fun when, when, when once you start actually looking at tutorials, it's, look, look how people use these tools for like modeling and simulation and, and whatnot, then you extrapolate those techniques into trying to building something which is, which is line art. It was such a cool, cool experience. And this is, this is like in, in action. It's just mesmerizing, just sitting there like watching this thing uh, just go. It's, it's super cool. It, it's, it's almost like a, like a meditative uh, uh, experience, to be, to be honest. Uh, unless like you, you run out, out of ink uh, mid-print, then it's not meditative at all. And these are some of the, uh, of the, of the, of the prints. Sadly, like, you know, like they look so much cooler like in person because you can see all that, that kind of texture on paper and all these small imperfections that you get uh, one, like, like when actual pen is like going across the, 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 the paper. Excuse me, yes. You mentioned the uh, thickness of the line and stuff that is generated by a uh, uh, speed of the pen with the... Yes. Uh, I mean, you don't get into for that. I mean, the computer like defines the width of the line and then... No, 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 no. So, so, so you don't define the width of the line. You just define the paths of the hand moving. I mean, you can, you can, uh, everything was printed through Inkscape. It's, it's similar like Adobe Illustrator. It's just a vector path. Yeah, yeah. You can say whatever the thickness you want. It's just going across that vector. And the so thickness depends on the pen you're using. The thickness of the line in the outcome of the drawing. By choosing the thickness of the pen. The thickness of the, or the speed is predetermined or... You can, you, can, you can adjust the speed as well. If you have a thick pen, which kind of leaves a lot of ink, if you make it move slower, the line will diffuse more. Yes. <laughs> can you what? Sorry. Can you control the speed with the attribute? And not per stroke. Currently, only per print. Okay. <laughs> uh, but that's actually a cool idea. So what I'm actually trying to do now, I'm, I'm trying to replicate, uh, currently unsuccessfully, but I think I'll, be, I'll get there. I'm trying to replicate actual like paintbrush uh, painting. The trick is that you have to kind of program it to return back and to pick a color, yeah. uh, like before every stroke. So it's a bit more trickier than actually kind of just kind of drawing a, a, like a continuous or million paths. Uh, so, I mean, luck bit, uh, and I guess like when you're an artist, these things happen. Uh, two days before I was supposed to open my exhibition, the building where my museum is caught fire. <laughs> I guess the artwork was too hot. <laughs> Uh, luckily, nobody was injured, no material damage, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, artwork was a bit smoky uh, in the end. Uh, but yeah, they, they, this is actually me on the balcony waiting my turn to be uh, rescued. I don't know. Maybe if I died, maybe this would be worth a lot of money. Who knows? <laughs> Uh, but in the end, I did like open my uh, exhibition. Um, it was like a one-day opening. Uh, uh, like the pride was so much inside of me. It's gonna, it's only going to last one day. <laughs> All this work, uh, but nevertheless, uh, such an incredible like learning experience uh, uh, for me, and such an incredible like uh, sidestep from the things that I that I that I usually do. Uh, and I try to kind of play with the with the place as well. Like these these big prints. Uh, because I wanted them big, they were not like actually drawn on the on the plotter. They were actually printed. 
all of these smaller things which are framed were, were printed on the, on, the, on the plot. And these things, I, I literally wanted this to put in a corner. Once you kind of break this face and like put it in the corner, it, it like get, gets so much like cool dimension when you, when you put the painting in like, like that. It was, so uh, the actual input was a 3D model of a face, which I converted to a uh, height field. Mm -hmm. And then from that height field, I like back to like a little bit of height field processing, then to mesh, then like I was calculating, you know, like slope gradients, like which, which actual point points like downward or upward in, in, in which vector. And I used that to kind of drive. And then I actually, what I did is I spawned the initial um, uh, particles uh, on the uh, like, Contours on wherever the, the the facial contours are the most sharpest because I want to uh, like have the more more accents of those lines to kind of capture the facial features yes and then I kind of use those slope gradients to move those particles upwards and downwards and then then kind of combine them yeah yes 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 yes, yes, yes. and uh, like like it went well like it was it was actually too too many people at the opening it was too hot at certain at certain point. Uh, I also had the time to actually convert a bunch of uh, these uh, 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 like installations into uh, AR experiences uh, uh, as well. I rendered out a couple of animations and I, I turned them as, uh, as well. So what's next for me as an artist, you ask? <laughs> uh, this, this is my like, forever pain. And I, I don't think that I'm alone here. Uh, at least I will not uh, uh, suspect so. Uh, so next thing. Uh, now I'm trying to like move this to a bit more uh, level. I'm currently tr trying to like working on a phase two of the exhibition. Phase two of the exhibition should be like more uh, like actual like interactive uh, installation. That's my desire for the for the next for the next phase. Uh, I'm also trying to find a new a new place uh, uh, as well because the physical museum is going to close uh, sadly soon. So I'm currently like searching, trying to kind of expand my artistic uh, desire towards, or actually building like a bit more permanent uh, interactive installations based on the on the artworks that you have uh, seen there. And these are kind of just some experiments that I'm just slowly, slowly, slowly cooking. Uh, this time, this passion project is probably going to kind of take a little bit of a uh, of a slower time uh, because I don't have that much free time currently to to do all those things. And on the topic of that printed uh, flower, I'm also like looking to finish this project of myself, which I also want to kind of finish and 3D print. Uh, I found out this book, which I bought for my kids. It's a fantastic book. Such a lovely like illustration for, for like plants and whatnot. Incredible source of inspiration. And actually did completely procedurally a couple of flowers and I don't know how you even call them nuts or whatnot uh, in, in, in Houdini. And I want to expand that to have at least like one for each category uh, of the of the of the flora in the book. And then I want to like do a little bit of a, a more complex and like a bigger 3D print uh, as actually like a like a sculpture, like a big uh, bigger one. And that's it. And in the words of a proper artist, of course, I'm going to quote myself in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> what happened to the museum after the fire? <laughs> uh, like the like the actual build, uh, the core of the building burned down, where the elevator shaft was and the and the stairs. Uh, the actual apartment where the, all the museums are didn't sustain any like physical damage. It took around maybe five days just to kind of ventilate out all the all the all the smoke. So it's France, it's France now, uh, no, sadly no. But for some other other reasons which are outside of my jurisdiction. No, but now that you mention it, I will use that. Yes. <laughs> It goes along with the narrative. Thank you very much. So, is there something comparable to Houdini? Like, could you do all, all these kinds of things with something else? Yes, you can do it in processing if you're mental. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, if you know, if you're like 
I mean, there's a lot of things which, which a lot of tools that people use for, for like creative coding or, or this kind of art. Like there's processing, there's like VVV, uh, I think there's a couple of even more uh, that I kind of used to do. But uh, I, in like nowadays, I tend to, I focus to write the least possible amount of, of code. And Houdini, I think now is in a stage where I can actually do everything you see here with, uh, with notes. And I have these this friends, uh, which also do, can do a little bit of, of this type of art, and they're complete purists. Uh, they're like, we're going, we're going to code everything. Uh, like they code like their own like simulation engines when they need stuff. They, and I'm just like, but that's two clicks for me. And they, they're so pissed at me all the time, but I just go and laugh in their face, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, Houdini, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not really comparable, to be honest. I haven't, uh, like, okay, disclaimer, I haven't used Maya in maybe uh, five, six years. Uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, and probably, probably nothing changed at that time, <laughs> knowing how to desk, <laughs> because I you know nothing has changed in, in Max. Uh, but uh, there is nothing that you can compare Houdini to, in my experience. Houdini. Yeah. I mean, there's some similarities. So Houdini's MASH system for some projects, um, but the, the, it's nothing like Houdini, of course. No, so Houdini doesn't care about your art at all. So Houdini only cares about which type of data you give it and what does it want to do, what do you want it to do with that, with that, with the data. Which is a, a little bit painful to learn, but once you do, it's such a liberating thing to, to use because you can do literally anything then. You're not in any way constricted with a tool, and which is awesome. Yes, 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 because I can say, hey, you polygon, go there and do that, whatever that is. And it's very difficult to do some kind of things in, in like usual DCC tools. So what it, so yeah, what it did, uh, the materials that you can see in here, the tentacles and the, yeah. And yeah so, uh, the, so I modeled the screws and I said, Houdini, take these 1,000 screws, simulate them dropping from a meter. Then I got like 1,000 screws like on the ground. And then I said, let's bake a, like a displacement texture looking from the top. And I, just like converting it to a height field, for example. You get just kind of height data from there. And then I took it to a substance sampler and I just kind of added dust and, uh, and uh, rust and stuff like that, which is easier to do because it's a texturing or altering, altering tool. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, hi. Hello. Yes. <coughs> do you do everything just in Houdini or do you have any other software that you use regularly? Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm a kind of guy that's going to use the best tools. I, I'm not a, like a fanboy in any sense. I, I'm, I'm literally going to use whatever tool is going to do me the best thing for the problem I have at hand. Uh, Lugbeat, most of the time these days, Houdini is the best tool for that, for that problem. So usually um, when I, I, I very rarely like model specific assets uh, on, on work. Uh, I usually kind of deal with the actually kind of building systems and procedures to help other artists be better. Uh, so that's all Houdini, uh, Houdini for me. For texturing, I still use like substance tools, designer and painter. That's like for me, hands down tool for actual like uh, texturing. And then uh, at home, even though I sometimes uh, could be think like faster to actually model something in a proper or sculpt it, I, I, I these days even like enjoy the challenge of doing things procedurally. Even maybe that that's not the the faster way. Uh, but the thing is, like, once you build a system to model something procedurally, it's completely non-destructive. You can go back and change whatever you want, and every other model, f like, de which derives from that, is basically like free. So most of the time, it's 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 Houdini. I should probably just, like put it in my Windows startup every time soon. It's just like so I have to click it every time I, I log into Windows. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Yes. I'm doing all of this on a laptop. <laughs> yes, uh, it's a like strong laptop. To be honest, it's I think it's like three years, two year old i7. I think it has 2070 RTX inside. 
So nothing spectacular, you know. Okay, like some simulations you wait five instead of three minutes. But look, like I'm not dealing with cinematic levels of quality here, you know. Like for those kind of things, and like Bola will probably testify, you need proper, proper tooling and equipment. Yeah. But for me, as a hobbyist, sorry, as an artist, <laughs> yeah, that laptop is, is way, way more than enough. Yes? Uh, you've been passing along with uh, Boston's 3D sample recently at Big Journey. Yes. What's the process with that? I mean, have you been chosen? I saw that you've been doing a presentation for, for uh, Adobe for it. For uh, yes. So the thing about, uh, like, I'm I'm like a I'm like a raven. I see a shiny thing. I, I run towards it. I fly towards it. So of course, AI is a is a is a is a curious thing to experiment uh, both on a, on a professional level and on a personal level because you're always looking for opportunities to see how we can like speed up uh, production. And we are always using AI in certain aspects of production at, at work. And uh, of of course, I tested out using it uh, uh, um, like for my personal stuff as well. For now, I'm only testing it on actually, uh, because like doing concept art, that's, I wouldn't say easy, but that's like the main, probably the main thing to, to use it for. Uh, right now, I'm experimenting two things. One thing is actually like building materials uh, out of AI images. And second thing is actually building 3D environments. Because once you have like a uh, generated image, you can start extra extrapolating data from it. And you can use that data to actually build scenes uh, inside of uh, Houdini. I haven't showed any of that yet because it's very early experiments, but hopefully I might be able to, to show something soon. But again, you're still finishing Houdini, right? You're yes. Still yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> because anytime I need to like wrangle some actual mesh data, like actually do something with the models, that's, that's Houdini for me, you can, of course. Okay, yes. Uh, so you said there are some things you shouldn't do as your beginner project in Houdini, but uh, procedural environments you should. Are there any other uh, I think that Houdini, Houdini is, is a beast. It has so many like contexts that, that can really kind of intimidate you uh, once you start like l once you like open it. Uh, so what I would suggest is that start with a single context and ignore everything else. So for example, Houdini is uh, it's like SOP context. It's basically what like what like modeling, like dealing with with geometry. Just focus on that first. Ignore everything else. Just pretend it doesn't exist at all and uh, do some pretty cool tutorials. Atagma has really nice tutorials because they're very simple, but with very high impact uh, results. You can like easy follow and get something cool very easy. And then once you like go through a couple of them, you will get a hang of like how the actual information flows through Houdini. And things will like start getting easier and easier and easier. Uh, like a couple of like, I don't know, like five, six years ago, if you wanted to do like simulation and stuff like that, it was a bit more difficult. Luckily, side effects did a lot of really good things to kind of bring all those tools on a more kind of what, what you call like a sub level. So you like you have a node with just like simulation. You have like you don't have to like manually go in and connect all the proper channels and stuff like that. So now it's it's way way easier. So thank you side effects for that. Continue doing that if you ask me. I know that like hardcore Houdin users are opposing that, but. Yes, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I can see the view with the light. Think of the beginners. Think of the beginners. Think of the artists. Anybody else? Awesome. Thank you very much.